Hello and welcome to another episode of Suggesting. I am really looking forward to today's episode because three years ago I was left with a choice. Horizon Zero Dawn or The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild. Well, I'm a massive fan of the Zelda series so it wasn't even a choice. But recently a lovely person in the community gave me a key for this game. So I thought it was about time I played it. Find out whether or not I'll be suggesting to you Horizon Zero Dawn. Horizon is a brand new IP made by a Dutch company called Guerrilla Games. In recent years they're the ones responsible for Killzone, but now they are making a somewhat futuristic yet tribalistic, apocalyptic, now making me sound like a rapper, scenario where mechanical beasts exist, get you wielding a strong as hell bow and arrow. To say I was intrigued is an understatement. This whole game makes you question why and how Earth ended up like this, and I tell you what, they filled this game to the brim with lore, so if you're in it for an inquisitive yet badass journey, you are in for a treat. I'm not going to hold back in telling you what weapons and arrow types are available, so be warned if you care about knowing the weapons before playing this game, you may want to skip this section. But it is very clear that combat is a huge focus of this game. How you fight varies heavily on your playstyle. I found myself a stealth guy to even the odds, then running in head on. And that's one thing I love about watching other streams, is seeing how people approach the same problem as you, but tackle it completely differently. And one of the games to give me that same vibe is Breath of the Wild. Speaking of playstyles, there are lots of weapons available. And even within those weapons, there are many ammo types to vary it up. Prefer to immobilize your target to get a free hit? Then the rope caster or electric trip wire on the trip caster is for you. Want to use their weapons against them? Then the terror blast arrow with your war bow is for you. And before I give examples of all the uses, I think it would be best to go over what I used and how it adapted over time. At the start, I was cautious with everything. If it was bigger than a watcher, I was using a rope caster to get them tied down, get my free hit, and repeat it till I took it down. Then I used the hell out of the trip caster, always examining their patrols, placing many explosion wires or shock traps to stun them. The biggest moment for me, and honestly everyone, is when you get a war bow which is where your sharpshooter bow goes from being a slightly higher damage, slower draw speed weapon to an absolute essential in every fight. Now you no longer need to break every component, but instead most can be torn off with a terror blast arrow. The enemies like Ravagers and Thunderjaws are made significantly easier, and yes, while they're still deadly, is how being able to turn their own weapons against them is insane. I also highly recommend you use the notebook to examine your foe and take away his annoying abilities. Fed up with how that rock breaker keeps bothering, destroy his hands, and that is no longer an issue. And this is one of many examples. You'll often find yourself with your own method of dealing with enemies. Some are more prone to tactics than others. For example, the Thunderjaw is incredibly weak to fire, so I take his disc launchers, set him on fire, and then when that made him stagger, light him up. And because I played this one very hard, I'm not sure about the other difficulties I like. However, I found a way to deal with these guys very easily, but he could still turn around and one hit slap me to death. So at no point when you're taking him down, is it easy to relax without being punished for it. One thing Horizon has achieved really well is the variety of enemies you'll encounter. Let's list them off. Watcher, Grazer, Strider, Charger, Lancer, Broadhead, Corruptor, Shellwalker, Thunderjaw, Snapmore, Stormbird, Sawtooth, Firebellaback, Freezebellaback, Rockbreaker, Scrapper, Longleg, Stalker, Trampler, Ravager, and there are also corrupted versions of all of these, and there's even a few extra in the Frozen Wild DLC. So yeah, how about that for a list of enemies? I must say 99% of the time combat worked really well. A lot of the source of my frustration was me fighting an enemy all wrong. For example, I could have sworn to you that the rock breaker at a distance after his digging mitts are gone are broken as hell, because he spits rocks in a devastating fashion, absolutely wrecking your health and often killing you. But later on I realised, hey, don't give him distance. But one issue I did have is just occasionally hits didn't register, and I mainly noticed this on human enemies, but again, not a massive problem. But in the final human boss, and a couple times where I just sat there like, that hit, right? But I digress. There is one more big combat feature that I haven't addressed. You learn how to corrupt these beasts to be on your side. So another combat option is to be sneaky sneak, find the biggest badass boy there and make him fight for you. Which can be yet another way to level the playing field. They are seen as an enemy to others who aren't corrupted. 
so whether you need to back up or use it as a distraction, this has you covered. To complement this whole system is a skill tree which will help you adapt to your playstyle. If you're a bit of a completionist like me, in some aspects you will most likely finish most of this tree, but in the early stages it can really impact on how you take things on. And it's broken down into these categories. Prowler, which is stealth focused. Brave, which is damage and all round general fighting focused. Followed by Forager, which is all about, well, foraging and crafting. And the final one, which was added by DLC, but is with you from the start, is called Traveler. And this is essentially adding some quality of life improvements, such as being able to get mounts for faster traversing, picking up resources while mounted, and getting more resources, and adding more time to the machines you have overridden. But speaking of traveling, let's jump into the next section. Another big draw to this game is the sheer size of the world. It's not the biggest, but it's packed with life. Questing, activities, and a huge variety of environments, from the forests of the sacred lands, the desert of the Kaja, and the frozen lands of the Osaram and the Banuk. There are plenty of places for you to visit. I think the closest comparison to this game's exploration is mixing Ubisoft with Witcher. The map is insanely icon heavy, but it is explained in lore, which is Aloy's earpiece, and when she climbs the tall neck, let's think of them as viewpoints. They'll give you information on the area, its terrain, and the types of beasts you can expect to encounter. Now we have viewpoints known as tall necks, but I want to emphasize there aren't too many of them, so it doesn't become mature, and due to the size, how you begin the climb, along with a few subtle differences, it never feels drawn out or tedious. I also like to bring in the Witcher comparison, because like that game, I actually cared about the characters, the side characters, and their quests. They're well voiced and quite often they tie into the main story, and at the end in particular, but that's all I'll say. Now we briefly mentioned that you can override machines in the combat section. You get this ability when you explore one of the few cauldrons, and no I'm not talking about the ones you get bored in by a group of hungry trolls or what witches bore their potions in, but Horizon's cauldrons are essentially factories. You'll go through these, sneaking and killing your way through in kind of an exploration mini puzzle journey, and at the end you'll have a boss to fight be it a Thunderjaw or a Bellowback, and when you defeat them, you override the terminal which will expand the range of those you can control. And much like the side quests, there aren't too many of these, and they are all slightly different, which meant it didn't feel like a chore, but a sense of mystery of what I will discover in this one. Speaking of discovery, and I will go over this more in the story section, but my god does this game create some lore for you. The world is absolutely jam-packed with this stuff, and so if you are stuck with this ever-looming question of how the hell did this all happen, you can find out with not only written logs, but fully voice ones too. And while I didn't always read them, but in areas of interest where the remains of a titan-like machine are around, you could be damn sure I gave it a listen. If you are a typical RPG player when exploring such as, oh, this is the right way to go, so I'm going to head the other way and see what's there first, you will be heavily rewarded. And this reward is called Power Armor. This stuff is almost broken in how strong it is. Adapted armor from the old ones. You collect power cells and not many when exploring ruins. I will also stress that the story will take you to all of the locations. But if you don't explore once you're there, you will miss them. But when you get it, enjoy the perks because my god your fighting style is about to get more bold. This game has three great things for it. It's world, it's combat, and its story. So I'll gloss over it because I want you guys to experience this one too. But for those who want those juicy spoilers, I'll have a section for that one as well. It starts with showing this world. And not only will you be left with a conversation of how did we get here, but I always love the contrast of the old and new ways. Here we are with tribes living in the old ways. Each one has their own god or craft, but at the same time, there are these mechanical beasts which are so futuristic. It's insane. So right off the bat, I was incredibly intrigued. You are then shown Rost, who has taken a baby to be blessed, but you quickly learn he's an outcast, and this is where you get an insight to the tribe on how he is shunned. But one person is on his side, and Aloy is blessed. I always found it funny how her name was so similar to Aloy, but I'm guessing that was the intention. As you're exploring as Kid Aloy, you fall into the ruins of the Old Ones, and I still find it funny when this game refers to people ahead of us as the Old Ones, but I'm getting distracted. And you're exploring these ruins, and you find an earpiece that is now providing with lots of unseen information only visible to the wearers. This is how they introduce the core mechanic, the show that not only can she see information left behind, but she can analyse machines' pathing and components, thus finding weaknesses. You will have a moment where yet again you'll see how this tribe, the Nora, treat outcasts. 
It ain't pretty, but here is where they introduce dialogue choices. I think a lot of people compare this to the likes of Dragon Age, where you have a loving, angry, and logical response. And largely they are good. I only had maybe one moment where I thought I didn't think it would come out that way. But having a say in the dialogue, all voiced, well voiced might I add, is great. And there were only a couple AI characters that I thought the lip syncing looked a little bit odd. I'd also like to take a moment to compliment this game's soundtrack, because it is absolutely beautiful. And I would happily listen to this anytime. I would do sometimes during our just chatting sections over at twitch.tv forward slash the mounting, by the way. You were then shown a montage of training so that Aloy could prepare herself to face the trials, therefore be accepted and no longer an outsider. So you will now see her get to slowly better and better and older until she's all grown up, and this is where you resume control. You have a touching conversation with Rost, and even though our time with him is quite small, you can really feel the connection between these two. And seeing them say goodbye as Aloy desperately tries to keep him around is really quite sad. But you head off to the tribe for the trial, and you are reminded yet again of how Aloy is treated, and it just made me hate all of them, and this kind of outsider tribalistic behaviour is a theme you will see throughout. However, you do meet at least two interesting characters. One who seems like there's much more to him but very dismissive called Olin, and a rather drunk but actually nice to you Osoram called Erend. And the way he says how he doesn't understand how the tribe looks at outcasts and outsiders reminds me very much of this whole what happened in Game of Thrones with Dawn and how they don't recognise bastards the way people in Westeros do. You start the trial and you can see they're against you. A trophy you grab is destroyed and you have to hunt for another. So it sets you off on the back foot, but this is where they really show you the platforming options. By taking the dangerous route, you not only catch up, but get ahead and win! But as you're accepting, the host is killed and everyone is under attack. You hold off what you can, but you get a taste of what the cult is capable of. You save some of your fellow trial members, and then the arsehole dies, along with Vala, which is sad, but not so much for the guy though. Sorry mate, but shunning me and throwing a rock at me when we were kids has come back with a vengeance. You put up a fight against Helis, who also is voiced by Crispin Freeman by the way, get to see Kaito-san back. <laughs> I'm getting distracted, but you get defeated. All hope seems lost, but it turns out that Rost hadn't left after all, and he was watching over you. He comes to your defense, putting up a pretty good fight. After all, despite being an outcast, he has a fierce relationship as a warrior. However, he is stabbed, but in his last moments, as all seems lost, he rolls Aloy off a cliff to safety. Pretty lucky if you ask me, but I'm no longer questioning game logic. However, it shows him saying, survive, as he disappears in a sea of fire. Not gonna lie, I was very upset, and it's moments like this is why I'm so paranoid about characters like Will Sully, for example. You are then taken to the Sacred Mountain, where it turns out you came from, and the door confirms you as a 99.47% match to Dr. Ellen Sobek. What does this mean? But it's corrupted and can't let us in. The matriarchs are left in awe as the goddess spoke to you, and despite the judgement of that damn Lanzara, you are made a seeker. This means you can leave the sacred lands and not get banished for it. So Aloy goes from being an outsider to one of the most important members. Oh, how the tables have turned. Lanzara? <laughs> Now, after going on about the story, I have barely scratched the surface. I'm now going to very roughly summarise, because if you couldn't tell, the lore and story is next level. If you're inquisitive like myself, if you don't go looking, you'll miss a lot. And coming from the guy who stayed up all night because he got caught up in political intrigue in Markath while researching Dwemer books till 6am on a school night, the story is there, I am down. You'll meet so many interesting characters along the way, and usually when I think, there's usually about three characters at most, but in this one, hmm, let's see, I'm gonna say Ross, just because the question of what caused him to be an outcast is a pretty big incentive for Aloy, but the people who are alive, rest in peace Ross, <laughs> but let's list them off. Val, strange psychopathic Nil, Erend, Olin, Teb, Warchief Sona, Cast, who reminds me a lot of Thoros from Game of Thrones, I swear. There's also Ursa, Darvel, Avard, Vanasha, Bahavis, Uthid, Helis, and Silence. And that's not even including the many more mini stories we get over the side quests. And actually, that reminds me, Talana as well. You will head through all these lands, meeting these great characters while completing the many optional activities. You will journey through not only learning about the enemy cult that killed many Nora, but also the old ones. You will head from ruin to ruin, slowly piecing together the puzzle with the assistance of a mysterious person called Silence. 
buts, I will leave it here. Let's just say I got so emotionally invested in this possible future scenario, I broke my four year strong streaming rule, and I dropped a certain C word about a character I haven't mentioned. Yeah, but before I divulge any further into the juicy details, let's enter the spoiler zone. Everything comes together to this moment. You part ways from silence and find out what happened to the humans. They did, in fact, all wipe out. And not only that, but the planet was effectively extinct. After the machines made by Faro Industries went rogue and managed to mass produce themselves and consume everything, turning trees, everything including dolphins, into biomass. But the question is, how are the humans here today, in the year 3020? Well, Dr. Elizabeth Seibeck, with many talented staff, created an AI capable of being fully autonomous and sentient, able to feel and know everything so that it could create not only the environment, but humans again. The AI known as Gaia is made up of a few components, and one of them went rogue and is what's corrupting all these machines. You learn the time to crack the code to shut them down would take so long that one of Gaia's many roles was cracking these codes over the last millennium. But one question is left. If all this was planned, everything compiled to teach humankind their history and how to not repeat the mistakes they did, because as they say, those who can't remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Well, it turns out Tim Farrow, the man responsible for these machines, also erased all the information they had planned to educate the next generation and then killed all the heads of this plan. Yeah, I was pissed, guys. But you get the database to repair the door back in the Sacred Mountain, you explore where you came from, and turns out you were created as a failsafe. If Gaia couldn't fix it, she was hoping the clone of Elizabeth Sobek would be just as brilliant and help restore and save humanity just like she did. And hey, she was right. You obtain the code to disable Hades and everything comes together. Everyone you have helped has been inspired by everything Aloy has done for them. And you face off against the machines and after they laid waste to many Nora in the Sacred Land. Which only made this fight more enticing. You are use some pretty awesome weapons from the Osaram, have a fight against a mighty Deathbringer with the help of Talana and Erend, you have to compile everything you have learned to take this mechanical monstrosity down. You do it. You manage to stop him before he's able to activate every machine via the signal array and you breathe a sigh of relief knowing the world isn't going to end. But after the credits roll, the sneaky suspicious silence captures Hades in his own little device. To what ends? Well, a sequel seems to be the answer to this question. I'm not really going to be going huge into the Frozen Wild DLC. But know one thing, it's more Horizon, enticing story, more of a challenge so it doesn't feel like a step down and they add an interesting twist to explain it all. So if you're looking for a new environment to explore with plenty of questing, story and new enemies to face, it is for you. And the complete edition, which includes this DLC, can be picked up quite cheap. Horizon Zero Dawn took me on a fantastic journey, although I feel it's a tad icon heavy in places, and enemies such as the Stalker, the bane of my life, it has the trifecta. Combat, story, exploration. They also give you plenty to do with its side quests, errands, self-imposed combat challenges and plenty of lore to boot. It took me 60 hours to beat the game and I'm genuinely tempted to go for the Platinum Trophy because it didn't feel like a chore. You can also pick up the Complete Edition for a pretty reasonable cost. So yeah, I'm suggesting you play Horizon Zero Dawn.